Well, I feel like also a part of this um, this sort of quasi-religious uh, way of looking at economics, um, it fits also into, I, I think it's bled, bled into environmentalism. So if we're talking about, you know, addressing climate change, uh, the ecological crisis and so on, there is this real emphasis on moving from fossil fuels to what's been called green energy, sustainable energy, and so on, renewable energy, wind, solar, you know, there's a whole, you know, nuclear is thrown in there as well, often. Um, and I've, I've used this platform to critique that quite a bit. Um, but uh, something that came up in my uh, research of, of your work is uh, Jevons paradox. Um, if you could describe this paradox, I, I actually think it'd be interesting as well to, to kind of have a little bit of history to this because I want to know who Jevons was. Uh, I think in your lecture you gave that I watched on YouTube was really interesting to kind of learn about him specifically uh, and when this this came up uh and uh and how it applies to to energy systems today in this so-called you know green revolution that's to occur right now yeah so uh jevons well he was the late 1800s and he's one of these uh, victorian scientists um you know i have his letters or his correspondence in this wonderful old book that i've read that says, what was it? William Stanley Jevons, his letters as compiled by his wife. <laughs> Quote, why, why quotations around his wife? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, uh, she presumably, well, she, I'm sure she had a name, but that was not what was put on the binder. Oh, okay. <laughs> <It's>, all right. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so I mean, reading his correspondence is very interesting because he's, you know, he's obviously an extremely sincere, serious guy. Didn't do especially well, perhaps, in his schooling and was sent off to the, for his first job after school, to the Sydney Mint. So he was supposed to be in job, his job was just being responsible for the Mint in Australia. I'm sure that wasn't, you know, the top post one could have when you think about, you know, these famous scientists like Rayleigh. Mm -hmm. who, you know, of course, had much more esteemed positions. But, yeah, he went to Sydney Mint, and, and um, there, you know, I think he actually started dabbling, I uh, really quite admire him, in meteorology. Um, he ended up working on developing some of the first studies of how rain gauges work and some of the first models of how clouds behave, which mm -hmm. weren't right, but, you know, were interesting nonetheless I like i think it's fascinating this is actually my research this is what i do i develop brain gauges and study cloud dynamics mm -hmm. it's my main what i actually get paid to do not mm -hmm. this economic stuff mm -hmm. and then you know but he somehow he we ended up back in england and then he created this um wrote this book that was very influential for a while called the coal question and you know Again, he wasn't probably the smartest guy, but a very, very deep thinker. And he was the first to really put two and two together that England was constrained in its growth by finite coal reserves. Hmm. Which, of course, it ended up being, I mean, without the North Sea oil, you know, the England did actually end up being in trouble in terms of its finite coal reserves. But part of this was that he came up with the insight that James Watt's steam engine, this thing that really instilled a revolution, which was that the steam engine that James Watt created was efficient. Mm -hmm. there, was, there were prior steam engines, but James Watt's steam engine was, was quite an efficient one. It was very much a revolution. Mm -hmm. And what he realized was that that increase in efficiency was not going to decrease coal consumption, but rather increase it because it made coal more accessible, coal being useful, mm. and now being able to be able to be consumed more efficiently to do more work now became more attractive. And then that would lead ultimately to people acquiring steam engines and then consuming, in the end, more coal. 
-hmm. Now, he approached this problem with his own framework, which was not a strictly thermodynamic framework, which is the way I've approached it. So I've arrived at the same conclusion that Jevons has, but I think you know, it's probably safe to say it's within a far more general context mm -hmm. so that it could be applied to any system. And so there is a key thing here, which is to acknowledge that any system, when I say system, it could be like a body, a hurricane, you know, a global economy, a star, whatever it is. Sure. That all systems are what we use in thermodynamic terms, open. And what that means is just like I said, you know, we consume food and emit weights to eat. But there is a key aspect that people frequently miss when they are thinking about the role of efficiency and let's say environmental questions. If we're talking about a car engine, a car engine that's more efficient consumes less fuel. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that, that's easy to imagine. And that's sort of yeah. the assumption that we take. But we aren't car engines. A car engine is a fixed size. You and I are not a fixed size. So the analogy I like to think of is like a growing child. So if you take a growing child, it consumes energy and loses waste heat. But there is an imbalance. The child consumes more energy than it loses through waste heat. And if there is an imbalance in energy, then the child uses that imbalance to take the matter. I'm introducing matter, not just energy, but to take the matter in food and to use that energy, that excess energy, to take the matter in food and turn it into human flesh matter. And it's a number that a lot of us have actually heard about that there's about, you know, 3,500 extra calories per pound of weight. This is, you know, one of these, you know, weight loss and gain things that if you want mm -hmm. to lose a pound, you actually have to create, you know, this rather daunting imbalance of mm -hmm. losing 3,500 calories. And that's actually quite hard to do, of course, which is why weight loss is hard. So if we have that imbalance, we can actually grow. Mm. No, so let's contrast two kids, one that's healthy and one that's unhealthy, sickly. Which one would you say is operating efficiently? I think you'd say the healthy one's operating yeah. efficiently mm -hmm. because all the processes are going on appropriately of, let's say, where they can convert the mm -hmm. energy and food to flesh matter. Mm -hmm. If the kid is, heaven forbid, cancerous, well, there's something else out there that's taking that energy away and it's not enabling the kid to turn that energy into human flesh. Mm -hmm. So an efficient kid is able to turn that excess energy into growth. Mm -hmm. If the kid grows, well, guess what happens? Consumes more food. And of course, we, we see this, you know, like a kid that goes through adolescence has a growth spurt because something's going on that makes the system more efficient. They yeah. grow quickly. And then, of course, you know, there's nothing left in the fridge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they have an appetite that skyrockets. Right. So this is the key difference here. It is a question of efficiency. How efficient can a system enable this change from energy and energy imbalance and turn it into a growth of that system? Now, there are two sides to that coin. The system can be efficient or inefficient. So I do atmospheric sciences. A big example is hurricanes. And a lot of us know a bit about hurricane dynamics because, of course, they're big events. If a hurricane passes over a warm patch of water, it's got a large amount of energy to access, and the imbalance is large, and then it can use that excess energy to create a bigger, faster hurricane. The moment it passes over land, 
the whole process becomes inefficient. There's all sorts of frictional losses to the trees and land, vegetation, whatever, and the hurricane rapidly decays. Mm -hmm. Same with us, if we have cancer, there is this external predation that makes us um, inefficient and we can waste away and die. At which point, like you introduced, we no longer consume energy. Mm -hmm. For civilization as a whole, if we can access reserves of energy and raw materials efficiently, like if we discover, as we did in the 50s, Saudi Arabian oil. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> the world's are, I mean, 1950 to 1970 was, I doubt it will ever be reproduced. If we're, and I don't think it had ever happened previously. Yeah. Things change so fast then mm-hmm. because we could grow quickly because we had the fuel to power it. And then we could access with that fuel the raw materials that enabled us to build the makeup of civilization. And we grew very rapidly, ultimately, to consume energy at a much greater rate by 1970 than we did in 1950. And we've actually continued to grow that rate up until this point, but now it's starting to teeter. Right. Yeah. And so how do... Um... So, so what I'm hearing is that the more efficient energy uh, consumption, production, and all of this is, the more energy that's ultimately going to be consumed. And it seems that the, if we're going to, if we're going to mitigate climate change and global warming and, and the sort of heat engine of civilization, as it were, if we're going to mitigate the effects of that, um, efficiency isn't the goal. It should be to limit. If it's almost like we need to end the amount of efficiency that we're kind of increasing. It seems like we need to be inefficient. And it seems like any attempt to, to uh, move towards degrowth, which it should be the really the goal in some, in some form or another, uh, is not about making more efficient energy systems. Um, it seems to me, though, that that's exactly the problem, though, is that the way it isn't, the entire subject is being framed is that wind energy solar energy and all this is becoming increasingly more efficient as the technology improves. And that's seen as like a positive thing. Uh, so I think, yeah, it seems like everything is, is completely backwards with all of this. Well, yeah. I mean, fundamentally we live in a capitalist system. Mm. Yeah that is organized around increasing. I mean, I, I mean, capitalism, I don't know, it's kind of a weird term, but I mean, basically, I mean, thermodynamically, we, we are constructed around growing what we currently have mm-hmm. so that we have more. The means we have for doing that, as you astutely state, is by becoming increasingly efficient. In fact, just not even becoming increasingly efficient, just being efficient. Mm-hmm. Be, gaining efficiency turns out to just accelerate this process. Mm. Now, here's a conundrum, I think, which is that our current state of efficiency is, I think you can sort of replace that word a little bit with just our technological acumen. I mean, how, I mean, it's not just technology, but in a very, very general sense, I mean, you could talk about just even culture mm-hmm. as being a form of technology. I mean, for example, imagine how would the world work without the alphabet? Mm-hmm. The alphabet was a very, very rare invention. I think it was only invented independently twice in human civilization, mm-hmm. not just characters, but the alphabet, but the alphabet mm-hmm. has supplanted everything. You know, we don't use characters because the alphabet is infinitely flexible by comparison. Mm-hmm. Imagine human civilization, how it would operate in terms of its efficiency without the alphabet. Mm. And that's, you know, not like the technology like an iPhone, but no, it is actually technology. So imagine, you know, our current state of efficiency as being sort of in some ways a, a sort of a very collective way of being able to efficiently take energy from environment and turn it into the stuff of civilization. 
that involves all the cultural and technological, however you want to term it, components of the way we do things. But that these components, these, this acumen has been developed over a very, very long period of time. In fact, strictly, you could go back two million years because that's when we first started to tame fire. I mean, it wasn't even humans, homo sapiens, it, but you know, it was, mm -hmm. we started to tame fire about two million years ago. And you think, you know, that was a technological advance mm -hmm. that led to the, you know, gradual increasing supremacy of humans kind of over this planet in terms of our capacity to change things. Yeah. You know, it wasn't just the Romans 2,000 years ago. It was, you know, there's civilizations all over the place. And we underestimate just how much was, was going yeah. on.